Okay. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from today. Welcome to the Youth Resilience in the Digital Age Conference. On behalf of the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada, we would like to recognize the contributions of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples of Canada. In honor of reconciliation in education, we acknowledge and give gratitude to the Indigenous peoples whose land we are on today. My name is Jamili Baroud and I am the Program Officer for the Canadian Teachers Federation. I'll be responsible for moderating this session today from Vancouver, British Columbia. Before we start, I'd like to recognize that this initiative was made possible by funding from Employment and Social Development Canada, and that this week's conference is proudly co-hosted by the Canadian Teachers Federation and the Boys and Girls Clubs of Canada. Please also note that today's session will be recorded and available on the conference website by Tuesday of next week. A short Q&A period will follow the presentation, so please use the Q&A function to ask questions to the presenter or to communicate with technical staff. Please also feel free to use the chat function to connect with other participants, share resources and interact. At the end of the presentation, I'll invite the presenters to answer your questions in the order that they were asked. And now I'm glad to welcome Christy Allen and Kathy Teverge from Respect Group. Christy is the Director of Research at Respect Group, an e-learning organizer organization aiming to empower people to recognize and prevent bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination through interactive online training courses in sport, schools, and workplaces. She specializes in knowledge translation and mobilization and community engagement in the youth mental health sphere. Kathy is the project manager, manager for the Respect Group in School program. She was previously an educator with the Toronto District School Board for 20 years and is the parent of two children ages 13 and six. Their presentation is today is called Empowering the Bystander Online for Youth, Parents and Educators. Welcome Christy and Kathy and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the introduction. We're going to share our slideshow and we'll get started. Just waiting for it to come up. Okay, well, while it's loading, I'll just say that Christy and I are happy to be here today and happy to share our knowledge and our experience as it relates to empowering youth online. More about us in a moment, and let's start with the background of Respect Group. Respect Group was founded in 2004 by Sheldon Kennedy and Wayne McNeil. Wayne is a former, was a former trustee in Alberta, and his background is in IT. Sheldon Kennedy played in the NHL for eight years uh, with Detroit, Boston, and Calgary. And he's most known for his courageous decision to charge his junior league coach with sexual assault. Wayne and Sheldon came together, met each other at a fundraiser, and their idea was to create an online program to reach every coach, which they developed into respect in sport. And they, developed the idea of bad behavior, bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination. That's where it all started. Are you okay to move on, Christy? Yes, I just wanna make sure you can see my screen okay. Yes, I can awesome. see it now, yeah. Perfect. We'll move on to the 1.5 million. I'm still on the first slide. Sorry about that, I'm not quite sure. I, I still see the first slide. I'm not sure if everyone else does. Sorry folks, we may be having a few technical challenges here. I am on the right slide, but it appears you can't see that. 
Okay, well, I'll just keep talking. So, so far, uh, Respect Group has certified over 1.5 million Canadians. And what started with just respect in sport has now grown to respect in the workplace, respect in school, keeping girls in sport and stay in the game. So respect in sport is for not just coaches, but officials, youth leaders, anyone in a leadership role in the sporting world Res and, uh, and youth leaders as well, I should say. Uh, respect in the workplace is for staff and it deals with adult to adult interaction. Respect in school is the program that I'm the project leader for. And um, the program is for all school leaders, teachers, EAs, principals, custodians, bus drivers, any leader that comes in contact with the students. And it's those relationships that we look at. The Keeping Girls in Sports um, was developed because we found out that girls quit sport at a two to one ratio to boys. So this is for coaches, coaches managers and officials to, to try and keep girls engaged in sport. Stay in the Game is designed for 10 to 12 year olds to help them find their voice and have fun and to keep them engaged and active. To find out more about these programs, you can go to the Respect Group website and um, you can also uh, ask your organization if they have an affiliation with Respect. Many different sports organizations, in fact, most of them do in Canada have some kind of affiliation with Respect. So check out the Respect Group website for more information. How you doing, Christy? These darn computers. <laughs> Sorry, folks, I'm trying to figure it out here, but um, having a few technical difficulties. Let me see here. Are you able to see anything now? There we go. I can see all the slides. Sorry about that. Christy had to switch computers and <laughs> learning a PC over a Mac. Yes, so I can just take us back to what Kathy took us over here and you can let me know where you'd like me to click through. Okay. I see the whole presentation. Are you able to click present, Christy, or is it just not working? Sorry, I'm having some uh, pretty major technical difficulties here. Yeah. Duncan, do you have the slides or do you want me to share? Is that Duncan there? Okay. Can you see, so, can you see it okay. now? I can see the slides. Um, are you able to put it in present mode? Maybe it's, okay, there we go. Okay. Uh, if I could go to the next slide, Duncan, there's just a little bit about Wayne and Sheldon. Okay, so there's the different programs that I mentioned uh, through Respect Group. And so feel free to check out the Respect Group website to find out more information about each program. All righty, Duncan, can we move on? Okay, so a little bit about us. Um, as Jamie Lee said, I am a mom of two, a six-year-old daughter and a 13-year-old son. Uh, I was an elementary teacher for 20 years with Toronto Board and now the project manager with respect and Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, uh, the Ministry of Education has made a commitment to offer the Respect in School program for free to all school leaders. And Alberta has also added Respect in Workplace um, available to all school leaders for free as well. I work with um, organizations related to education um, for example, the superintendent's organization in a province um, to help communicate and implement the program uh, in the way that suits their needs in their province. Christy. Thanks, Kathy, and thank you so much, everyone, for your patience as we did a little troubleshooting there. I'm so sorry, having major computer issues today, it seems. 
Um, so I'm the director of research for a respect group. I have a master's of public health degree and my background is in psychology and family and child studies. So I also do a little bit of work in youth and family engagement in the mental health field. All righty, Duncan, can we move on? So today we're going to get going and Christy is going to help us define and understand what these uh, virtual bad behaviors look like, the bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination. And she's going to explore what it means to empower the bystander online. And then I'm going to share some tools and tips for different groups to take action against virtual maltreatment. So we'll look at how youth, teachers, and parents can um, understand and, and have tools at, uh, at their realm. All righty, over to Christy. Thanks, Kathy. So yes, we'll start today by talking about bad behaviors on the next slide. Um, so we use this acronym BAD to define bullying, abuse, harassment, and discrimination. So I'll start on the next slide with bullying or virtually cyberbullying. So cyberbullying is de uh, defined by the Cyberbullying Research Center as the act of repeatedly harassing, mistreating, or making fun of another person online. And elements of cyberbullying include willful behavior that is deliberate and not accidental, repeated patterns of behavior that aren't just one isolated incident, and that the target or victim of cyberbullying perceives that harm was inflicted. So in our programs, we talk a lot about intention versus impact. And what we're really thinking about here is what the impact on the victim is. And so on the next slide, we'll talk about abuse. So in general, um, child abuse is any form of physical, emotional, and or sexual mistreatment or lock, lack of care that causes injury or emotional damage to a child or youth. And the misuse of power and um, a breach of trust are parts of all types of child abuse. So in the virtual world, some behaviors that can be considered abuse include cyber threats. So electronic material that either generally or specifically raises concerns that the creator may intend to inflict harm or violence to others or to him or herself grooming. Um, so some people use online mediums across the internet to connect with children so that they can exploit them or even blackmail them for sexual purposes. And befriending a child in this way is known as grooming. And then there's another online, online phenomenon called catfishing, which refers to the practice of setting up a fictitious online profile, which is most often used for the purpose of luring someone into a fraudulent um, relationship, whether that be romantic or otherwise. So next we'll look at harassment. So virtual harassment involves any unwanted interaction that is intended to annoy, alarm, or abuse another individual. And this can often have elements of discrimination um, that it is sometimes rooted in targeting someone based on their identity or group membership, which includes but isn't limited to sex, gender, race, ability or disability, and sexual orientation. So virtually this could look like cyber stalking, repeated harassment using electronic devices and network technology that can include threats of harm or is highly intimidating and intrusive upon one's personal privacy. Another form of this is sextortion, which is threats to expose a sexual image in order to make a person do something or for other reasons, such as for revenge or humiliation. And if the image is distributed, this is sometimes known as revenge porn or non-consensual pornography, which is defined as the act of distributing intimate photography through different means without an individual's consent. And of course, this is particularly harmful when young people are involved and the images distributed are of children. Um, perhaps a less severe form that, of harassment that can happen online is known as trolling which is deliberately or disingenuously posting information to entice people who genuinely want to be helpful to respond often emotionally. And this is done to inflame or provoke others. So lastly, we'll talk about discrimination. Um, discrimination is an action or a decision that treats a person that, or a group badly for reasons tied to their identity, status, or group membership. And these reasons, which are also known as grounds, are protected under the Canadian Human Rights Act. 
So online, this can take many forms and can be intricately tied into bullying, abuse, and harassment. And you really don't have to look far, unfortunately, to find this online um, among young people and also among adults in comment sections and viral videos and beyond. So as I mentioned in the last slide, we can, we can move forward and talk a little bit about the overlap among these behaviors. So there is quite a bit of overlap um, especially when these behaviors are occurring online. So for example, sextortion or catfishing have elements of both harassment and abuse. And common among all these behaviors is an abuse or misuse of power and the intent to harm another individual, as well as a breach of trust. This is a really common issue across these behaviors. So understanding the differences and similarities across and between bad behaviors can help us to better navigate the best way forward um, when they happen to the young people in our lives or when we see these our, ourselves online. So in the next clip, this is a clip from our Stay in the Game program. Um, this is designed for youth and it may not work, we'll see. <laughs> but if it's not working, this clip is available in the resources section. Um, so maybe we'll skip ahead for now, but um, essentially, it explains how we talk about these sort of difficult topics in a youth friendly way. So we have a section um, in our Stay in the Game program about bullying as well as abuse. Um, and something that is really interesting about this clip that I really enjoy is that it is presented in a way that's intended to keep young people informed, but really not to scare them. Um, the idea is to empower them. So I'll talk a little bit about the impact of virtual bad behaviors. So unfortunately, these behaviors are both widespread and common. So statistics from the Tell Us Why Start Cloud documentary on virtual maltreatment in Canada show that 60% of Canadian youth have seen cyberbullying or online abuse within the past month. Um, statistics Canada estimates that 41% of young internet users experiencing cyberbullying also are reporting an emotional, psychological, or mental health challenge or condition. And discrimination is also quite prevalent online with 49% of LGBTQ plus youth experiencing cyberbullying. So the outcomes of experiencing maltreatment online are not only uh, impacting the target or victim as, as well as their family, friends, and peers. And further, these behaviors often extend offline, impacting young, a young person's school or social climate. So we can move on to the next slide here. Um, there's a really interesting study done by MediaSmarts um, that demonstrated the clear negative impacts when it comes to online harassment, particularly sexual harassment. So this study found um, that of 800 Canadian youth surveyed in August 2017, 42% who had sent sexually explicit photos or sex had one of their photos shared non-consensually, either in person, electronically, or of most concern on a public forum. Um, further, there is a significant number of youth who did not have the tools or knowledge to step up or step in for their peers, with 38% feeling that there was nothing they could do to help when these images were being shared non-consensually. So this is also taking place in a culture of sharing, which is leading to peer pressure. And 79% of youth who expected their friends to share these images with them have shared images themselves, where 35% of youth who did not hold this expectation have not shared these images. And we can move on to the next slide. And again, I'm so sorry, this video is likely not going to work, but it is available in the resources section. Um, this is an expert clip from our Respect in Sport Parent Program, and Glenn Canning shares the story of his daughter, Retea Parsons, who experienced relentless cyberbullying and cyber abuse before ending her life in April 2013, and he has quite a powerful message about how the internet has no delete button. So we can move forward to the next slide and talk a little bit about what it means to empower the bystander. So many of us are well aware of the harm that can come to a child or youth experiencing these bad behaviors, but we're often unsure about the next steps to take if we suspect or learn that a child has experienced maltreatment. And I use the term maltreatment to encompass all of these bad behaviors. So empowered bystanders have both the knowledge and tools to take action when maltreatment is suspected or disclosed. 
This means that parents, teachers, and other trusted adults have a clear awareness and understanding of the signs of abuse and what constitutes maltreatment, as well as knowing what to do if a child or youth discloses that they have been harmed or are being harmed and the steps for reporting this suspected maltreatment. And this also extends to young people knowing how to step up and step in when they see their peers experiencing harm online. Maltreatment is truly an issue of power, so the offender attempts to control or overpower the victim and cause harm. However, bystanders who suspect or are aware that maltreatment has occurred also have an incredible amount of power to either better or worsen the situation and ultimately the outcomes for victims of maltreatment. So it's quite normal for individuals to delay or not disclose that they've experienced maltreatment, particularly online. And if maltreatment is anonymous or if they feel that there are no true mechanisms for stopping the spread of this bullying, harassment or other harmful actions, they may not say anything. But if bystanders witness or suspect maltreatment and also don't say anything, victims might believe that the behavior is acceptable and that they would be powerless if they chose to speak out. So this can contribute to feelings of isolation and hopelessness. However, if bystanders do intervene as allies for targets of maltreatment, young people are much more likely to feel supported in reporting what they are experiencing and seeking help. This also helps children and youth to understand what is and isn't acceptable behavior online as they learn to navigate new virtual spaces and ways of connecting. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about a really interesting Media Smart survey. Um, they surveyed 1,000 Canadian youth ages 12 to 18, and they explored online hate or casual prejudice, where people use words or say things that are negative towards a specific group, but not necessarily aimed at a particular person. As we know, however, this hate often feels and is personal when aimed at specific characteristics of one's identity or group memberships. So youth felt more comfortable intervening when they had empathy for the victim, felt that most people would agree with their position, use platforms with clear rules and reporting tools to address bad behaviors, and if they were interacting with people they knew in real life online. And their top two preferred responses for addressing hate were either blocking the person and stopping the communication, or talking to their parents about what was going on, which is another really important reason that parents need to have these tools as well. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, on the flip side, key barriers that prevented youth from pushing back against online hate or casual pre prejudice included self-efficacy or whether they felt that they knew what to say or do to stop the behavior, uncertainty around the context or intention of the behavior, and moral disengagement, which is also known as finding reasons to justify or excuse this online hate. And perhaps most importantly, 50% of youth surveyed did not feel that they had the self-efficacy to speak out or act against online hate and had this really strong fear of making things worse. So for me, this, this highlighted two key points. Um, one is that youth who have both socio-emotional skills of empathy versus moral disengagement, as well as the knowledge around ways to act are much more likely to step in against online hate. And the second point is that while context is tricky to navigate, especially online, the impact of the behavior is much more important than the intention in this case. So while youth may not always understand the intention behind what someone is trying to say online, if they can flex those empathy muscles and imagine how the behavior could hurt someone, they're in a better position to act against online hate. And with that, I will pass it back to Kathy. Okay, great. Thanks, Christy. So we're going to move on. We've got a lot of information now. And what do we do with that information as youth teachers and parents? So I'm going to go through some tools that each group um, can use to deal with maltreatment online. And um, there's lots of great resources and you could read forever. So I've tried to gather some of that information, summarize it and highlight some of the key points um, so that it's easier for you to go to. And I just want everyone to remember that you are the best tool in your toolbox. That's first and foremost, first and foremost. You all have your own strengths, you all have your own experience and knowledge and ultimately you are the best tool. So let's start off with youth. Let's look at the youth toolbox. Okay, we want youth to stop and think 
before they send in regret. We want them to take that pause. The internet can be anonymous and in instant, and it causes us to, it's easy to believe that we can say or do anything without repercussions. But as we know, that's not the reality. There are rules and acceptable behavior for online. So we need to get across the point that if you wouldn't do it face-to-face, -face, then we shouldn't do it online. That screen, hiding behind a screen, doesn't, uh, doesn't change how we should treat people. Uh, passwords, there's really no reason to share a password. There really isn't. Um, you know, your parents, a trusted adult, that's, that's the only people that may need a password. Um, same with your cell phone numbers and email addresses. There's so many ways that you can connect with people and you don't need to share that information. So personal information, photos, they should not be shared online or in chat rooms, especially where you don't know people. Um, posting your email or forwarding naked photos of yourself or anyone else, it's just, there's never a need to do that. There really isn't. And we need to let youth know that and reinforce that. We want youth to stand up to bullying behavior. We want them to let the sender know that it's not okay. And we want them to reach out to the person who has been targeted or maltreated. We want youth to talk to a trusted adult about their online relationships and what they see. We want that open dialogue. As we heard from Christy, parents and trusted adults are key in online safety and maltreatment for youth. And we want youth to know that they, they need to protect themselves. They need to take care of themselves. They need to make a copy, take a screenshot. They know how to do these things better than we do. They can probably show us how to do it as parents and youth leaders and educators. Um, and most sites, uh, you know, for example, F Facebook, they have their own policies and you can usually report uh, online maltreatment directly to the site that it happened at as well. Uh, just ask, you know, Trump about tweet, tweet, Twitter. <laughs> um, if you are forwarding, you are a participant. Youth need to be, need to keep that in mind. They need to be part of the solution and not pass it on. And they need to ask themselves, would I find it funny if it were about me? Making it real. Okay, so then we'll move on to tools for teachers. Um, TELUS Wise has some great resources for teachers for various uh, age groups and grade levels, um, all the way up through high school. And Media studies is part of language and English throughout the curriculum, all the way from grade one to high school. So media studies focusing on the art, meaning and messaging of various forms of media tests, texts, allows us to keep up to date with whatever the current media texts are to be looked at, analyzed and discussed. So the one specific lesson plan that was for, I believe, grade um, nine and 10 was titled, Let There's No Excuse, Confronting Moral Disengagement in Sexting. So it gives a lot of background information, there's videos to show, and the focus is on what they call sneaky excuses. Things that convince us to do things when we know we shouldn't. You've probably heard these excuses. They categorize them into the four areas. So denying the harm. Being bullied is part of growing up. Just, just part of regular growing up. You've probably heard it. We now know it's not part. It should not be a part of growing up. Justifying the harm. It's okay to lie to, you know, to keep someone out of trouble. Shifting responsibility. Kids shouldn't be blamed if parents do it too. I mean, parents do things online and use bad language. Doesn't mean that it's okay 
her youth to do it as well. Blaming the victim. They bring it on themselves. Look at what they're wearing. Look at their hair. Again, these are excuses that, that justify making these decisions. And it's not justifiable. It's not an excuse. And so it's a, the, the lesson goes into having the students create their own scenarios and analyze and share with each other. So you can go to that website and get all the details on that lesson as well. Okay, and uh, then I just wanted to share on the next slide that in our Respect in School program, there are um, many handouts that are available to the school leaders. And one of the handouts is titled Cyberbullying. So it gives you the overview, the definition of what cyberbullying is. It gives you some examples. This is just a snapshot of the handout. It continues on with some facts, the impact of cyberbullying, and then it gives you some research and resources to use as well. So some extra um, information there in the Respect in School program for educators. So let's move on to parents. I've got quite a bit to share here. Um, a lot of school leaders, educators, school youth leaders are parents as well. So um, this can be useful for um, many different uh, leaders and trusted adults in different settings as well. So the Canadian Red Cross has this um, resource where they talk about the 10 cyber safety tips for parents and caregivers. And so the first one is that key idea of talking to your kids, having an open dialogue from as early of an age as possible about online safety issues. They don't necessarily innately think of what the issues are. They just think, ah, you're a protective parent. Um, but voicing your concerns and putting little thoughts in their mind of things to look out for can be really helpful. And building some guidelines. Um, there's um, some information on the Tell Us Wise resource about um, having a family agreement around internet use at home and anywhere really. Be proactive, know who your kids are with online, spend time with them and ask them questions. You know, it's great that we don't want them to give identifying information, but I don't know who has anyone's nicknames are. So I'm constantly asking my son, who's lag pixel? Who's pizza guy? <laughs> and so, you know, now I know who all the nicknames are of his friends online. Uh, of course, never disclose personal details online. You know, having parents get that message across to their children and youth. Uh, never post pictures of themselves online to people they don't know. And that message again from Glenn Canning that there is no delete button. You can take it off the site, but there is no delete button. Once it's out there, it's out there. Someone has it, someone saved it and we can't delete it indefinitely. Reinforce that people online may not be who they say they are. Uh, you know, children and youth, um, you know, might not assume that uh, people are lying. You know, they, they assume the best in people, which is great. And we need to put that little bug in their ear that that might not be the case when you can't see people. We don't know for sure if they're telling the truth. So have that filter on. Um, consider using parent controls. There's internet filters, there's blocking software. Um, there's many different things out there, firewalls, but there's nothing like a good, open, honest, parent, trusted adult, open dialogue relationship. Uh, I always think about we have a pool in our backyard and when my son was little I wanted to protect him so badly from falling in the pool I bought every gadget that there was to make sure that if he fell in the pool alarms were going to go off but ultimately supervising the pool is the best strategy. So parents you're it. 
offer a no questions asked bailout as a safety net. Your children and youth need to know that if they feel uncomfortable or safe, they can come to you, no questions asked. Mom, I don't feel safe. Coach, I'm worried. They need to know they can come to you and there'll be no judgment and you'll listen. Be constructive about good places for them to visit on the internet. Rather than just letting them explore, guide them to some websites that you know are reputable and that you know are monitored. So this source from Canada Red Cross also uh, shared warning signs that your child may be safe, unsafe online. So you can check out uh, the Canada Red Cross and get more information there as well. Okay, we're gonna continue a little bit more with tools for parents on the next slide. How can I help prevent or reduce the impact of cyberbullying? Thanks, Duncan. So again, that ongoing dialogue, don't wait for things to go wrong. Start the dialogue, start it early, start it young and have it regularly. Set rules, standards and boundaries. Teens are less likely to engage in cyberbullying if there are rules about it. That's what a study showed. Educate and inform. Most kids aren't cyberbullying. We think, oh, everyone's doing it. It's actually not as common as we think. When they know that, the rates drop. Be aware of gender specific considerations. So whether you have a daughter or a son or you lead a group of girls or you lead a group of boys, they have generally various reasons for getting involved in cyberbullying. Girls tend to do it to get back at someone. Boys tend to do it ah, just for the fun of it. Ah, just bugging you, just fooling around. So consider the differences between girls and boys, depending on your, your group and your children, your audience. Understand where there is a greater risk. Uh, vis visible minority groups, um, you know, can be at a much greater risk. And um, I have my 13 year old son who uh, is on the autism spectrum. And so I know there is a greater risk for him to miss social cues. And, um, you know, that's why from the very beginning, I was much more vigilant with him online and still am to this day. Sexting and consent. No one should feel pressure to do anything. Goes back to the, you know, good old peer pressure and it applies everywhere. You should never feel, um, you know, pressured into doing something you don't want to do anywhere, anytime, anyhow. So what should I do if my child is targeted? Parents are the number one group that kids turn to. Christy mentioned this earlier. Most kids say that their parents make the situation better. So that just reinforces that we need to be there, tell them we're there, show them we're there, and keep that dialogue open. Stay calm and don't overreact. Go to the bathroom and scream for a second if you have to. Um, they will fear that you're gonna take away their device, which could create more feelings of isolation. So that's not necessarily what we want to do. We wanna stay calm, take it seriously and move from there. So don't minimize or ignore, let them know you're going to listen. You're gonna to listen to everything they have to say without judgment and work together with them. Stop, block, record and talk. So stop the site that you're on, leave it, block it, block the person that is uh, causing the maltreatment. Uh, you may need to take a screenshot to have that uh, evidence to, to show the site of what's been happening. And talk to other parents, talk to teachers, talk to kids help phone or the police if you have to. You as a parent do not need to go through this alone either. There's supports out there for parents as well. And on the last slide for parents, what should I do if my child is cyberbullying someone else? Again, stay calm. Even the best kids make mistakes. 
Doesn't mean they're bad. Don't overreact and don't take away their device. Do take that pause. <laughs> Make sure your child immediately stops engaging with the target online. There can be serious consequences um, for the person um, doing the cyberbullying. So we wanna make sure we stop it right away. Have your child explain the situation to you from their perspective. We wanna make sure we have a chance, give them a chance to help us understand why. And we want to make sure that they know that no matter what, it's never okay to be mean. We're there for them, we love them, we care about them. It's never okay to be mean. Talk to your child about how they can make up for the harm that they've done. It might be a phone call, it might be a face-to-face -face apology, it might be something that they post on the same site that's positive. Talk about a plan. Talk to your child about what led them to cyberbullying in the first place. They're probably angry about something, upset about something, maybe something happened before, they have feelings of anger. We want them to know it's okay to have those feelings and they need to think twice before they react. We want them to respond and not react. They want, we want them to talk to people um, that they trust when they have feelings and think twice about doing something online. How can I help my child stand up to cyberbullying? So comfort the person being targeted privately. Privately, Let them know you care. A lot of people that are targeted feel alone. So the best thing you can do is let them know that someone is there for them. Help the person being targeted report what is happening. Youth reported that one of the best things that witnesses can do is help them report it. Post something nice about the person being targeted. Say something good. Highlight the positive. Make them feel good. Let other people know you don't agree with the maltreatment that took place. Privately talking to the person doing the bullying. You might be able to send them a private message or a text or again, pick up the phone and have a conversation. If something is happening right now that they have to stop, they can try to distract the person doing the bullying, change the subject, show a, an emoji, put a funny video on, hey, do you see this video of this? And try to switch gears. Sometimes that's all that's needed. So hopefully those are some tools that you can take away with you and feel free to look at those sources in more detail um, if you wish. So I'm just gonna give you some personal reflections from myself as a parent or educator, as a parent and educator on the next slide. Thank you. So as a parent, the digital world has changed so much just between my two kids. When my son was little, it was just apps and games on the phone. And now there are so many more things online. My daughter wants to be on YouTube. My daughter wants to be on Prime Video and Netflix and all these other things. Um, it's also much more portable. Uh, it's much harder to keep it in the open area when my daughter has a little iPod that you know fits in her pocket and she can take to any room in the house. Um, it's, you know, I think we always say it, they're starting younger and younger. And um, I think part of that is they're seeing more people using devices and they want to be like the older people, the older sibling, the older cousins. So they see, in my case, a lot of cousins and older sibling who's on their phone all the time. And it's probably parents too. They see us on devices all the time and they want to be a part of that as well. So it's, it's a very quick changing uh, a world and it's very hard to, to keep up with it. Um, I've also realized that now that my son is 13, some parents no longer want to be proactive. They no longer want to have those conversations with their children and with uh, other parents. 
Um, you know, I've asked parents, do you, do you understand, have you heard of this game? Do you know exactly what it's about? Nah, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I've never seen it. Oh, do you, do you know this YouTuber and you know, what kind of language he uses and if he's appropriate? No idea. Do you, do you know what the kids are saying to each other on discord? Cause I heard some language that wasn't very appropriate the other day. Yeah. I I've tried as recently as the last month to have conversations with my son's friends, parents, and I find it really challenging to engage the parents in a conversation. Um, so I wind up, you know, supporting my son in having those conversations directly with his friends. As an educator, creating a respectful environment was top priority at the beginning of the year in September when you're just getting to know your students. Um, in Toronto, we were big supporters of a program called Tribes, and its goal is to create a positive and caring environment to allow students to feel included, respected, and to be actively involved. Um, there was a lot of collaboration and a, a real sense of community. And we had something called Community Circle, where we could discuss topics in the world, discuss things going on in our life, and you always had the, the right to pass if you didn't want to share. But it was a, a, a way for us to come together and communicate and open up and share feelings or ideas in a safe way. And I found that that was very effective um, and, and lasted throughout the year. And it was continuing to work on that throughout the year, not just doing it in September. When I was taking my principal's qualifications about 15 years ago, um, we were strongly recommended back then against using social media and there's so much more now one of our um uh leaders you know worked in the area of maltreatment and the stories he would tell were were scary and so something like having an account with a former student on facebook i know many of my friends are connected to former students through facebook um but what we don't always think about is that you know, someone can tag you in a photo and all of a sudden it's shared with everyone that you're friends with. And that might be a former student. And I know I've had friends say to me, oh, I saw you on the boat, you know, up at the cottage and I saw you hiking in the mountains and I don't post anything myself. So to hear that my friends are seeing what I'm doing without my permission is kind of scary. So not everyone knows how to use the settings about who things are going to get shared with. So something to keep in mind. I'm going to pass it back to Christy because I've talked way too much. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, I wanted to preface by calling myself youngish. I'm on the millennial Gen Z border. Um, so I haven't used a lot of the social media apps, but I'm definitely losing my touch with the different slang and thankfully my partner's younger sisters keep me up to date. But I remember when I was younger, there was these message boards like Ask FM that were just um, breeding grounds for hate. You could submit anonymous questions and um, it's not a good environment for young people who are so vulnerable to those things at that time. Um, and even if you have private accounts like I do, you're not immune to spam or these fake accounts. Um, they really are everywhere. I probably get a message about once a week. Um, so you're not immune from harm there. But something I really wanted to mention as well was that when I was a teenager and I was a ski instructor, I did have a child disclose to me that they were being lured online. And thankfully, everything turned out OK. But um, in the moment, I didn't really get a fully clear description. I just had enough information to know that something wasn't right. And I myself had never had any formal training as part of my job or anything like that about online safety. But thankfully, my dad was a police officer and he worked in cybercrime and crime prevention. So I knew what it was like because of the tools he'd shared with me. Um, and I was very familiar with what to do and, and when to say something. But if that child had disclosed to someone else, that may not have been the case. So. I just wanted to emphasize how important it is to equip youth from a young age with the understanding and tools of what healthy and unhealthy online behaviors look like. 
um, so they can step up and step in for the children in their care and, and peers like I was able to do in that situation. Um, so that includes babysitters and activity leaders and young people who are in these different roles with youth as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We're happy to move into the question period. And thanks again for your patience at the beginning with our little technical challenge. Um, thank you very much, Christine, Kathy. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this incredible presentation. And at this point, uh, we're going to start ask, answering the questions in the Q&A. So um, if you haven't posted them yet, please do toss them in the Q&A or the chat box. But currently I see one here. The question is, are there current, up-to-date, and engaging bullying video links available to present to children nine to 12 years old? Yeah, I can start just by mentioning the video we intended to show you earlier that is available on the conference resources page. Um, so that's from our Stay in the Game program. It's developed for youth ages um, about 10 to 12. So nine may be a bit young, but it could be a good fit depending on the young person. Um, and it talks about, it defines bullying and abuse quite well, but I know TELUS Wise has a lot of really great resources and a lot of them are grouped by age groups as well. And if you have any other resources you wanted to share, Kathy. Yeah, no, I was gonna say the same thing, Media Smarts and TELUS Wise, they have lots of great resources. And like you say, they're geared toward different age groups. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question here. Are there any features of online spaces that have shown to be particularly helpful for empowering bystanders? So example is ability to, ability to report others, uh, need for verified accounts, so on and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but that reporting tool and um, clear standards and instructions for knowing how to report is super helpful. The ability to block someone, um, Something I'm thinking of that where it may be a bit unclear, some of these online gaming platforms that a lot of young people use. Um, I know I have friends and other young people in my life who use these platforms and I hear them sometimes mention like, oh, I'll block you or, oh, I'll get you kicked out, I'll report you. Um, so having that ability to do so can be quite helpful and seems to be utilized by a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. Anything you wanna add, Kathy? Yeah, no, I, I was going to say my, my son has had some, some issues where he has been able to report uh, directly through the site. And our experience is it's always been dealt with very quickly and very effectively. Um, all right. I don't see any more questions in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, so I think that brings us to the end of um, that portion. I just want to make sure <laughs> before I close it. But yes, it, it does. So this brings us to the end of the session. Uh, we invite you to view resources um, and recordings of the event on the conference page. So that's digitalresilience.ca. And to tweet about the conference session using hashtag digitalresilience2021 and to take us on social media. Perfect. Thank you. So that would, uh, that's the, uh, sorry, the conference page there for you. So thanks again to Christy and Kathy for answering those questions and for the great presentation on protecting well-being, building resiliency, and supporting youth to take a stand against virtual maltreatment. All of the tips you mentioned were relevant, practical, and meaningful. It was a, a pleasure to have you with us and uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.